Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Career Pathways Virtual Trailheads. And we're really excited about this episode. You can see we've got a full house, uh, three panelists today. And so three times as many as our normal number of guests. And again, my name is Jason Klein. I'm the director of P20 Initiatives at Northern Illinois University. And we are excited to bring you three different people, uh, all from the suburbs, who are going to be talking about their careers. Uh, they're also all part of an organization called GCAMP, and we may or may not cover that in this. And if not, you can look at the description here on YouTube or on the blog for more information about that. In the meantime, let's dive into introductions so we can get going. Chris, can I have you start by introducing yourself? Hi, uh, Jason. My name is Chris Kaiser, and I work for Big Kaiser Precision Tooling here in Hoffman Estates, Illinois. And actually, I have uh, relinquished my running of the company uh, to uh, an associate of mine that's been uh, with us uh, for 30 years or 31 years soon. And uh, I'm a, an executive advisor now. Cool. Well, congratulations to you on that. That's a great success. Thank you. you. Paul? Um, uh, my name is Paul Remington. I am in a similar position to uh, Chris. Uh, I work for a company called Die Masters. Now it's called WA Die Masters, WA The Die Masters. We're a precision metal stamper and uh, automated assembly uh, manufacturing company. Uh, I originally uh, purchased a company with another gentleman and sold off my interest a number of years ago, and I'm what you would consider semi-retired. So I perform IT safety. I'm a safety officer for the company today and do facilities management, but I also spend a fair amount of time as chairman of Golden Corridor Advanced Manufacturing Partnership, GCAMP. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, Jason. My name is Kathleen Burley. I'm the executive director for GCAMP, Golden Quarter Advanced Manufacturing Partnership. And I've been in this role for the past three and a half years or so. My past bringing me here, I was a, I, I've sold cutting tools a long time ago and then made my way through education on the school board locally here. So um, basically bringing manufacturing and education together. Awesome. That's great. Well, we definitely want to dive deep into, into manufacturing and into what jobs look like in manufacturing. So we want, we want you guys to use your knowledge of across careers in, in thinking about answers. You can certainly give us examples for different roles in, in your companies or in other companies you've worked with or for as you think about answering questions because uh, one of the things a, a lot of people don't know of is, is what the manufacturing industry looks like across Illinois. What, what kind of info, I'm going off script a little bit here, but let's start there. I'm realizing I want to provide that context um, to students who might not be watching this, like in a metals class or in a welding class, and might have no idea of what goes on with regards to manufacturing in Illinois. And certainly at a time when we hear uh, so much about that related to economic policy across the U.S. What kind of information can you give us about the landscape of manufacturing in the state of Illinois right now? Well, in the state of Illinois right now, it's uh, luckily increasing ag again. Manufacturing is coming back because uh, it's kind of gone down last year due to the pandemic. But uh, naturally, with the new president wanting to, in, you know, uh, bring in uh, additional monies to for infrastructure, I think uh, that's a good place for the caterpillars of the world to be in. Uh, they and then the the ag people as well in agriculture, uh, building tractors and things like that. I think that is something that's going to help uh, the the state of Illinois. Unfortunately, we have lost uh, many a jobs uh, to other states because uh, of some of the policies that we've had in the past 30 some years, but uh, manufacturing is still uh, alive and well in, in Illinois and uh, is, I think has a nice future to come down the road here in the next few, uh, few years. 
And Jason, uh, I think one of our uh, biggest challenges is, uh, is people. We, um, we feel very positive about the future. We just brought in a 350 ton press, brand new with a uh, feed and everything. Uh, we have uh, another, I think three or four presses on order that we've be delivered in the next year and a half. So we're certainly very positive about uh, manufacturing future. But I think our, our biggest threat and um, thing we need to deal with is to find the skilled people that will be able to operate and uh, provide the tooling and the maintain maintenance of the tooling uh, for that equipment. Kathleen? Well, Jason, what I was going to mention also on top of um, needing those is manufacturing saves lives. Look what manufacturing has done throughout this, what we've gone through in this past year. How many of these manufacturers were able to turn on a dime and start bringing out the PPE that was necessary to save thousands and thousands of lives? And that's exciting. Um, and the other part of that, and it wouldn't happen without being um, as robust as it is, is the fact that manufacturing is, it's tech. It's not, it's not necessarily what our parents might think of as manufacturing. Manufacturing now is computerized, computer programmers, um, automation, robotics. That's how they run. You know, gone are the days when you have one guy running one machine in a shop. You've got one guy running three or four. They have lights out where they go home and through a computer, they're able to monitor those machines. So, you know, I mean, for, for students that are looking for an, an amazing career pathway, computerized, whether they're into computers, whether in, into hands-on, there's something for everybody. It's, those are those are really great points. Um, so before we talk a little bit about different jobs, well, actually, let's start there. What are some of the kinds of manufacturing jobs that you want to highlight? And then we'll talk about what work looks like in those jobs and, and also what the work you've done looks like after that. So let's go with this one more introductory question on what are the kinds of jobs? And we heard a little bit about that from Kathleen, but if you can think of just some specific examples and describe those to us, uh, that would be great. So we've, we've got some anchors for the rest of the conversation. Well, machine operators definitely are uh, lacking skilled machine operators uh, that, uh, you know, understand uh, and can set up their machines and program them themselves. The other thing that's needed too is programmers that program parts uh, in CAD and then CAMIT for uh, automatic conversion onto the CNC machine tools. Uh, very, very skilled and knowledgeable jobs that you don't necessarily have to go uh, to college for, that you can uh, get training through, uh, you know, from companies that you work for and or colleges, uh, I mean, community colleges, I should say. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, uh, a lot of that has uh, evolved in the last 10 years uh, in, in this area that high schools, as well as these community colleges has, have equipped themselves again with newer and state-of-the-art state equipment. Yeah, for us, uh, and I think it's generally true uh, one of the critical nature, one of the critical uh, positions that we have had to fill, and we did it through an apprentice, is uh, automation technician. Uh, anything in the maintenance area, which applies literally from food processors to mechanical assembly to CNC, whatever kind of company in manufacturing, okay. even maintaining uh, elevators, whatever, uh, requires uh, maintenance and automation type of, uh, of skill. And for us, more specifically, we need tool and die makers. Uh, the average age of our tool and die makers in this country is, is appalling. Uh, I'm one of those aged people, but we need young people uh, in those positions. Uh, same is true for people on the floor, whether it be fabrication, uh, as Chris said, machine operators, uh, quality control uh, technicians and inspectors, uh, as well as other business functions uh, within our company and other companies are, are needed. 
what are, what are some of those other business functions you're referring to? Could be logistics, or could be project management, uh, even uh, accounting. Uh, we uh, were in a position where we needed to hire an accounting person and had a very, very difficult time filling that position. So they run the, the other, other, other gamut of positions within a company, although we're not looking right now for a sales engineer, but one of the critical uh, uh, skills and, and positions within a company is uh, on the sales and marketing side. Yeah, so you're highlighting a number of important things. I mean, across, across industries, and we heard that multiple times just now, we know though, and I'm gonna start with those last few positions, we know we're gonna need project managers. We know we're gonna need logistics. I mean, any of any, anybody watching this who's ordered something online, that's one example of logistics of how that goes from you ordering it to getting to your door. And, um, and oftentimes that one of the things that I haven't mentioned with the three of you is for 10 years, I served as a, a, in a district-wide information technology leadership role. And, and certainly in the IT space, there is uh, two ways of framing Amazon and neither of which has to do with selling all kinds of different products. One is as a IT backend infrastructure company through Amazon Web Services. The other is as a logistics company, which is of course how a company like UPS or FedEx has repositioned their offerings as in more of an end-to-end -end logistics company, tend to be consumer B2B facing, I mean, not manufacturing, but those are really, really important roles. So I'm glad we're bringing up that full range of roles and you guys have just done an outstanding job of highlighting the different roles that are again, common across manufacturing settings um, for different kinds of products that are manufactured. So as you think about those, those manufacturing roles, we'll, we'll shift back to those. And you can also speak to roles you've been in. What does a typical work day or work week look like in those jobs? Well, I'm gonna well, let like the gentleman answer this one. <laughs> I, thought, I think well, Kathleen should do it. She's been in and out of enough manufacturing companies. <laughs> she can, she can, she can also home. talk about it. Yes. No, that is something definitely that's in your, your wheelhouse there, Paul. I'm sorry. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta bring that to you. Well, it, it depends uh, what people are doing, but uh, one of the things just from a very simple standpoint, most, most manufacturing companies, um, uh, where they're, they're uh, making chips or, or stamping something, uh, the workday is, is typically starts early. Mm -hmm. And I mean, 5.45, six o'clock uh, to 2.15, let's say is a, a normal, normal workday, uh, which allows people uh, kind of uh, some extra time uh, after work. Uh, but uh, as to what goes on during the day, it's, it's uh, Sometimes there are uh, things that go exactly right, but in most cases, there's something goes wrong. And so there's a lot of problem solving. A material doesn't show up, the material doesn't run right. Um, somebody thought about uh, this kind of packaging and it doesn't work. Uh, there are not enough bins. Uh, there's a constant change of uh, things that are required on a day-to-day -day basis. And all while you're doing that, you've got to be reporting what you're doing to the job, because that's how companies know whether they're making money on the job or they're not making money on the job. And so you're typically then involved in continuous improvement, 5S, you know, what do you, what can you do to improve this so that it isn't, you're doing, not to doing the same thing you did yesterday. So things are moving through the plant faster, you're using less inventory. So it's, it's uh, in team environment, it's, you're working with other people. Uh, so you're not all by yourself. Uh, but sometimes you're, you're at a piece of equipment or several pieces of equipment and um, you just got to gotta react to what's going on. So it's, it's, a, it's a very fluid, flexible environment. So I, I think one common thought out there is that uh, manufacturing is pretty routine work where you're doing the same thing over and over again. And Paul, you've just, you've just put the kibosh on that thought and and like most other jobs that we talk about in the 21st century, you've talked about teamwork, you've talked about that uh, whatever that continuous improvement process looks like 
from one company to another, but or or type of field to another, but that there is a continuous improvement process. You've talked about a very dynamic environment. And so I just want to call that out because I think that is really important. Um, and when I think across all of the different Career Pathways Virtual Trailheads videos we've we've done, I can't think of a single uh, video we've done where the environment hasn't been dynamic. And that's something we certainly hear from uh, teenagers and young adults is that they're looking to work in dynamic environments because um, it will be more engaging work. So I really appreciate you calling that out and highlighting that uh, from a manufacturing perspective. I might say I though, that as you are the initial grunt, you do get given some very basic tasks, <laughs> which might include sweeping the floor. Mm -hmm. it, it might include following and doing what somebody else has done and may include somebody watching over your shoulder. So uh, there's, uh, there's a continuum that says when you start, you're given a certain amount of responsibility and then it's added to that. And as you add it to that, the more you, uh, more is expected of you. I think in, in our organization, it's very dynamic too, because we are a little bit more sales oriented and customer oriented. We have, you know, application engineers, we have a marketing department, we have, uh, you know, stocking, uh, shipping department, inside sales, customer service, uh, IT oriented, uh, jobs that are taking place because we have to all automate uh, further and further and, and do things a lot faster than we did it, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, so by us, it, it starts at seven and it goes probably till 5.30, quarter to six. That's when six o'clock when the last people leave uh, because, you know, we service uh, our customers across the country from the East Coast to the West Coast. So. Uh, that's why we're open a little later than that perhaps most companies are because we have to supply parts and tooling uh, to customers on in the on the west coast we also have to you know advise them how to run certain tooling on their machines and things like that that are very much application oriented so uh, again in in our organization there's three four different departments and uh, they all have to work together for it to, to for, for us to make money. And, uh, you know, the engineers have to uh, cooperate with, with marketing, uh, coming out with new products. How are we going to introduce <laughs> it? How quickly is that going to take place? When do we have it available? We have different suppliers. We work with suppliers out of Europe, out of Japan. Uh, so we, we're kind of uh, connected uh, throughout the world to a degree with a product that we supply over here, but also manufacture over here. So we, we're we here by us, we kind of marry up all, all of those different products that, that are made, uh, like I said, overseas and or in the States and uh, sell it as a package to our, to our customers. And that is very much uh, intense and, and, uh, can take up a day pretty quickly. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I appreciate you bringing up the globalization of that. I mean, we're recording this, what, a couple weeks after uh, uh, the 400 meter long freighter got stuck across the Suez Canal. And so some of you may be watching this much later and may or may not remember that, but it certainly highlighted that, that week or 10 days of delays in the Suez Canal. Uh, the importance of of global trade and what that what that looks like for all of our lives. There's also, I mean, I was just listening to a, a podcast yesterday where they were talking about chip manufacturer fabs being being built in the United States again um, to to have stuff geographically located around the world. Um, in the event of natural disasters, geopolitics, et cetera. And so there's a lot of reasons why we'll remain interconnected, but we'll also need to have manufacturing functions here in Illinois, in the United States, et cetera. So I really appreciate that call out. Um, Jason, Jason, yeah, one thing that ahead, I was gonna Kathleen. mention on, on that same note, um, just, a, just a local story. Um, we were out shopping for a sofa for my daughter who's moving 
and um, we can't find one in the next three or four months because there are people who have ordered sofas that have ordered furniture um, four and six months ago that are still waiting for it. So you look at the way our supply chain in this country is and how important it is to start for companies to think about that reshoring and bringing things back to this country. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's one important piece of it. It also speaks to the project management side for companies. We, we There was this move over the last few decades to just-in-time shipping and manufacturing and, and product development and um, balancing that so you don't have inventory sitting on the shelf uh, unnecessarily, but also so that you have inventory available when people want to buy it. And uh, that's very, very challenging. And talk about a space for, um, for those that are interested in math and data, uh, that's a big part of, of doing that kind of work and making those predictions. And there's certainly a number of companies working in the artificial intelligence and machine learning space to help um, both consumer facing companies and, and manufacturers uh, with making those decisions about what they need and when. Um, so I, I really appreciate that couch example is a great example. But, but let's be honest, all that data on all that trying to predict could not have predicted what happened last year. For, for sure. Yeah, there will be exceptions to that, right? And this totally. is a I mean, example. Yeah. And, and it's funny how the supply chain disruption that that is going on or has been going on for the last couple months now, even more so than probably a year ago when things really got, sorry, crappy. Uh, it, it's amazing that we have more issues in the last two months than we had six months ago. Right. Literally. I mean, people here in the U.S., when you go back to like last summer, they're all buying washers and dryers and stuff for the houses because they couldn't go on vacation. Well, people who were still able to make some stuff and deliver it, but I guess those inventories all got drawn down to the, the last bit. And then, you know, Suez Canal. And we, we see it with, you know, flying product, bringing containers over with product in it. There's not enough containers left at this present mm -hmm. time to fill the need of what we have to have here in the States because we did not, we let everything, you know, 20 some years ago go offshore because it's cheaper and less expensive to manufacture somewhere else in the China. I, it, it, it's, it's, it's almost, you only realize it now what, what, what has happened. And, and the, the automotive industry, which was the first one to move out, is, is getting it on the chin now because sensors and all sorts of parts are, are putting, you know, rows and rows of assembly line, lines, they're dead. They can't assemble anything because they can't get all the right parts because they're, they're stuck either on the Suez Canal or, or, or in the supply chain somewhere. Well, and, th and that's where the chip shortage is a huge piece of this, because exactly. think about how many things we use on a daily basis now that have a, a microprocessor of some kind in them, and, um, and how many more things people have bought in the last year, partially because of the pandemic, and then the pandemic slowing down production with microchips. And so, yeah, now we can't assemble pickup trucks because we don't have tiny little microchips, um, but but that is a, a big part of the process, and uh, our you know students watching this certainly know because there was a new Xbox and a new PlayStation that launched last fall in advance of the holidays, and you still can't get your hands on one easily because of the same chip shortage that's affecting the manufacture of trucks most visibly and recently, but all kinds of other products. I. I mean, I heard yesterday the routers that, that Comcast and AT&T use, they're 16 months behind on delivery uh, because of chip shortages. So you, you want to 
uh, keep your router at home working if you want the internet to be working. So vacuum around it so it doesn't get too dusty <laughs> for the moment. And hopefully we won't lose our internet connections while we're having this conversation <laughs> because of that. Um, what, what would you say is one of the most surprising aspects of jobs in manufacturing for people who may not know as much about what's going on in manufacturing today? I think uh, how technology has evolved in the manufacturing space with, especially in metal cutting for us, it, it has to do with not only with the machinery that's developed, everything is going faster. It, 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 it has to move faster. It is automated. It is, it just needs a skill set that I think a lot of our young people have uh, with, with the technology that they have learned in a, in a consumer environment to a degree, but that is more applicable now, even in our industry. So I think that is something that it's gone in that direction, especially also with, uh, you know, the other two guys mentioned it too, automation. I mean, if you look at how many, I think last year was the first, was the, a record year for uh, robots sold in the US, units sold in the US. So. That alone not only helps us kind of try to alleviate some of that skill shortage, but on the other hand, you need people, young people that know technology, digital technology to program them. And, and then to, as Paul brought up, to maintain them, right? So we need- Correct. And, so, and then of course, there's the third set, the ones who design them from the, from the very beginning, right? So, um, right. which is gonna be more on the engineering side there, but critical to the manufacturing process. Going forward, um, the, um, the companies have as much to learn from the young students coming out of high school, coming out of college. They have just as much to learn from them as they do from each other. So that, that cooperative, um, working together that that we do see in a lot of companies now because they have you know our kids my kids they were born with this technology and those of us that well we aren't quite as young as our <laughs> uh, as we'd like um, we've learned them so they're not ingrained in us and I think that that can really help because we have to be careful not to lose that tribal knowledge that's at the higher end um, so it's important for companies and for, for students coming out to respect each other and learn to work together and get past some of those generational differences, which we see in a lot of places. So let's, let's go into that and thinking about, and all three of you are in great positions. You are the perfect people to help answer this question. What are the skills that are the most important skills for a high school student who, who may not may or may not have exposure to manufacturing coursework in high school. They, they might, there's more and more high schools doing that. Uh, there's also many high schools in Illinois that just don't have access to providing that either because of the number of students or because of funding or whatever the case is. Um, but what skills do you uh, most wanna see prospective new employees coming into the workplace with? What are most important for your, for your companies or Kathleen that you're seeing across companies? Um, soft skills. Soft skills are, are difficult sometimes because as these children have grown up with technology, they've become completely immersed in technology and they've lost a lot of that ability of what some of us would consider soft skills. So um, being can able you to define, talk to yeah, you give being us some able, examples. Sure, being able to to talk to to people, and we know that it's always been difficult when you're younger to talk to an adult to look them in the eye. But trying, it's things that uh, leaving the phone at home or in the locker, and it's it's showing up on time, showing up five minutes early, um, taking pride in the way you look. It doesn't mean you have to wear a three-piece suit, but make sure that the shirt doesn't have holes in it, and, you know, tuck it in or something. It's just those those little things and being respectful because the the way it goes is if you want 
someone to respect you, you have to respect them. And hopefully that goes around. So being respectful of people and expecting that they will be respectful back. But listening, you know, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. We got to listen twice as hard. So um, that would probably be at a high level. You know, there's other things. We have an incredibly hard time finding students that can get us a working resume and, and, and other smaller skills like that. Um, but Paul, Chris, what do you guys see? Well, I, I would sum it up as Dick. Bill Christ, our, our former and retired chairman said, in two words, attitude and aptitude. Um, you can have, have all the aptitude in the world, but if you've got a chip on your shoulder, uh, you don't have the right attitude, which falls into the soft skills category, uh, forget it. It's just not gonna happen. And uh, that attitude shows up as Kathleen said in all those soft skills. From an aptitude standpoint, uh, people need, do need to have uh, technical skills and it. And today more and more, it, it requires what we're doing right now. And that is to be on a, a Zoom call or a Teams meeting or a GoMeets and being able to facilitate that and operate in that kind of an environment. At the same time, you're learning Excel and Word and uh, Outlook uh, or the equivalent for Google. And, and then there's the whole number of skills related to uh, anything related to operating equipment and everything. Uh, again, that's, those are all things that can be learned if you have the right attitude. I second that. I can't, I can't add to this. It, those two guys just said it all. It's, it's really, we can teach anybody that has the right attitude, aptitude, and shows up on time and, and stays today. I, 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 that's all I can say. We, we can give them a good career in this place and move have and have them have upward mobility to learn. They just got to bring the right attitude and, and, and soft skills and, and, and they'll make their own way. The, the only other thing that I see with, with younger people sometimes, uh, you know, uh, it, it needs a certain amount of, not everything happens right away. Uh, it takes time to evolve, yes. to learn. Uh, you know, you, it, it isn't going to happen in three months that you, you know, you get a, a raise in your salary or something like that. You got to prove first what what you have learned, how you've done it, how well you've done it, how well you uh, work together with your with your cohorts in in the company, and and, and sometimes that. Sometimes the young people have a little bit of a harder time that it doesn't go fast enough for them. The, the gratification isn't there, the instant gratification. And, and, and that's one thing that, you know, we, we, perhaps we don't do a, a good job at this either by telling them these are, this is a, a, what we're looking for. These are the steps that it's going to take. It's going to take this long for this to be accomplished. Uh, and but then you know you have uh, all this. You, you have recessions. You have a, a pandemic. You you know things sometimes disrupt that development too. And you have to be understanding that it it just doesn't always happen exactly the way you want. And you have to have a little patience. There's a saying: um, you have to walk before you can run. So we need to teach them to walk and from that they can learn to run. I think one of the things that we're faced with, uh, particularly manufacturing, is that the entry level position may not be the highest paying, uh, but the long term uh, benefit of the kind of job, kind of responsibility and the long term pay prospects are, are far surpass uh, many of the retail kind of jobs. So. A student, my student or young person might be looking at two things and one is paying more right now, the other is paying less, but I, we would hope that they would look long-term. And that's where parents can help. So what, and, and what are the job prospects right now, would you say? I mean, we've, we've touched on this a little bit going all the way back to the beginning of this conversation, but 
uh, across Illinois, regionally in Chicagoland or in other parts of the state, the <clears throat> Metro East area near St. Louis, obviously Peoria and the Quad Cities uh, important. I mean, we know in Bloomington Normal, we've got a brand new, well, an old building, but a brand new electric car company uh, making waves. Uh, what, what would you say is the job prospects for a young person related to manufacturing today? There are millions of positions open. Whether you talk to the state of Illinois or talk throughout the country, it's a matter of fitting the skill with the job. There, there's there's five million five million manufacturing jobs to be had right now across the country. But students have to look for them, and they have to be definitive about that. I can't tell you how many students will will hem and they'll haw about an internship or an apprenticeship. Well, I think maybe they have, you have to be, you don't have to know at 17, 18, or 21, 22 what you want to be and do for the rest of the life, your life, unless maybe you went to college and maybe. But um, you don't need to know what you want to be for the rest of your life. You just have to know what you want to be now. So if it's something that you want to try, um, you have to be definitive about that. You have to go after it somewhat. Um, people aren't get, you know, pe people aren't chasing each other down for these. Manufacturers are out looking for students, but they want those students that we've talked about that will put themselves forward and try. They don't have to be perfect. They just have to want to learn and, and as the gentlemen have said, have the right attitude. Well, and, and I would add in, in my experience, both my own personal experience and as well as when I think about hundreds, thousands of former students, success in a job will transfer to success in other jobs, even if the skill sets are different because some of those things, and it was the list you guys gave a few moments ago, those will, will come in, that ability to listen and learn, to be there not only on time, but early to, to stay, to, to do the work that needs to be done that maybe isn't the most glamorous part of the job, but you understand it's a critical piece for the organization to function, the work to get done, mm -hmm. uh, and to step up and do that work and do it well, uh, whether it's sweeping the floor or unpacking boxes. Um, those can all be important things that really build in understanding what success in the workplace looks like. And then you'll take that no matter where you go next or if you stay and you'll continue to build on that success. Um, what, are, what are the things you've loved about your jobs? What, what we love about our job? Mm -hmm. That Not, not every day is the same. It's, uh, there's always different challenges that come unexpectedly that you could have not planned ahead. It, it's the, uh, you know, working together with different departments and, 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 and people and making connections through your associations that you belong to, uh, uh, just your network of people that that you got to know through the years. And if you stumble somewhere or have a problem that you can probably go and call and say, hey, how would you deal with this? Or how have you have you solved this problem? I think things like that is, it's just the, the, the network that you have built over over time that uh, that you can go back to that uh, helps support, uh, support your efforts. But, you know, you have to give in order to receive, too. So it is both ways. Uh, for me, it's, it's uh, constantly learning new things. And, um, and, and now in the position I'm in, I'm, I afforded the uh, opportunity to be able to also give back. And that's why I'm so passionate about uh, G Camp. For me, um, I just love to give back. You know, and I love the look on a student's face when, when he makes something and he gets it. And I love it when a company gets a new intern or they come to one of our events and they're shocked by what these students can do. Um, so I love the whole connection aspect. 
um, helping companies, but helping students. And it's priceless. Last thing, Kathleen kind of started us off with this, uh, talking about the pandemic and PPE, but how, how do your companies, companies you've worked for, that you work for now, um, or manufacturing more broadly, how do they uh, make the world a better place, have a positive impact on the world? Oh, anything that we all touch or fly in or drive in has manufactured parts in it. And actually some of those are probably made here in Illinois. I mean, there, anything and everything that you deal with in, in life has been manufactured. So it, it's, uh, perhaps we don't realize it, we don't know, or people don't know. But well, uh, I think the other, think other thing is uh, we uh, teach people how to work together. Um, and get into a high stress environment like uh, manufacturing is sometimes. Uh, people might have different ethnic backgrounds, uh, how we've dealt with uh, the pandemic and how careful we are with uh, screening and social distancing and masks, um, how we recycle uh, our metal, it's all recycled, our packaging, uh, it's just, you know, environment that we're in, if you look at it today versus years and years ago, it's a clean environment. Uh, and again, uh, you just look at all aspects of it. Like Chris said, uh, the stuff we make, uh, it's really exciting to see it in a, in a, in a lawnmower. Um, I buy a lawnmower that, that our parts are in. Uh, we are in snowmobiles, in automobiles. Uh, you name it, uh, our parts are, are, I call them gazintas. And we make metal gazintas. They goes into something, you may never see it, but uh, nonetheless, it, it's not held together if we don't, or you can't make it run if we don't have our gazinta in it. Awesome. Kathleen? I'll, I'll just say that everything, like Chris said, everything that we touch Everything that we drive in, everything that we see, and the food that we eat is manufactured. So um, I'll just sum it up with manufacturing makes the world go round. Well, this has been, a, it's first of all, it's been a real treat to have all three of you together. It's very interesting to hear you bounce off one another. Second of all, yeah, manufacturing is super important. And we've seen uh, certainly at this moment in time, both the current governor of Illinois and the president of the United States talk a lot about what they want to do to support manufacturing. And um, it, re you know, it remains to be seen, as always, with governmental policies, how that plays out. But certainly, it's important for our students to be aware that those conversations um, continue to happen and will have an impact on them one way or the other. And we really appreciate the advice that you gave, much of which will help our students regardless of the type of career that they find themselves in as we consider those essential skills or the soft skills uh, that you have to have across careers. So this has been great. I wanna thank each of you for taking the time to join us today. For students watching or teachers or others, if you have a suggestion for a career that you'd like to see highlighted, someone who you think would make a great guest, some questions we should ask, connect with us on Twitter at P20P20Network. That's all one word, at P20 Network. And let us know. Uh, we've got more episodes coming out all the time and we're really super excited as we hit the spring of 2021 about what's happening in school districts and community colleges and universities around the state with regards to work related to the career pathways. It's gonna be an exciting next few years in Illinois and it's, uh, it's a great time to be learning involved with that. And we couldn't do it without partners uh, like this on the business and industry side and in our communities. So thank you to G-Camp and all of the, the companies that are part of G-Camp. And thank you to the three of you for joining us today. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Jason.